She appears fully human. Her face, her voice, her body language all express clear emotion. I think I'm in over my head. Hey gang, I'm JP and welcome back to Egotastic Fun Time! We are now seven episodes in and this time Jean-Luc Picard finds himself seeking refuge from two dear friends as Will Riker and Deanna Troy return to help Picard discover a path to Soji's homeworld. What remains of the La Serena crew are caught between a cube and a hard place while Elnor and Hugh prepare to defend the XBs from Nerissa's wrath. Nepenthe has Hugh, Q, Bunny Corn Pizza to Chew as the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few in a series that is sure to be the last of its kind as the next generation becomes the final generation. Oh, and Seven of Nine is totally going to become the Borg Queen, you guys. But first, this series has had some great cameos in it, each with their own purpose and weight behind them to help serve Picard's story and push it forward in richer and more meaningful ways. But catching up with Riker and Troy blew all of those cameos away. I mean, I tried to divert all mental resources to my internal emotional shields, but Deanna seeing Jean-Luc walking up to the house almost made my tear ducts have a warp breach, you guys. It was a beautiful moment. Being that Troy is half Betazoid, it would have been nice if we saw her since Picard before she actually saw him walk up to the house, but once they were reunited, her empathic abilities sensed that he was in trouble, and she wasn't talking so much about his run-in with the Romulans as much as she was talking about his health, his life. Many of us have forgotten that Jean-Luc has just begun suffering from aromatic syndrome and he will die from it at some point. Unless Q steps in and cures him. We'll get to that in a moment. When Picard reconnects with his true number one, we see Riker in the kitchen preparing to cook dinner. He's listening to jazz and grating some cheese. Will's affinity for cooking was first introduced in the TNG season two episode, Time Squared, where he makes the crew some alien omelets. Riker also posed as the NX-01's chef on the series finale of Enterprise you guys, but real cooking on Star Trek is actually not very new. Captain Kirk also preferred cooking to eating whatever a replicator had to offer. He liked to cook eggs as well. I love that while their cabin on Nepenthe seemed like a nice escape from technology, once Will understood that Jean-Luc was in trouble, he activated shields and perimeter defenses and even started a scan for cloaking technology. It was a nice throwback to when he and Picard served aboard the Enterprise together, especially during the dinner scene in this episode, which was absolutely meant to serve as a parallel to all those conference room meetings from the TNG series. The Picard series takes place 20 years since the last time we've seen any of these characters. The lives they've lived in that time are equal to the length of time we knew them all those decades ago. These characters are just as wonderful as they were then, if not even more so, because of the two decades of additional life experiences to learn and grow from. But I can't say that I know them. I knew exactly who they were, not exactly who they are. But it's apparent how important all of them are to each other. Picard's biggest challenge in Nepenthe was to get through to Soji. They only met five minutes before transporting to the planet from the Borg cube. Soji was just put through a horrific mind game from that dick nugget Narek, and not only just learned that she's an android, but that she was only created three years ago. Her entire life is manufactured. All her memories were implanted. She doesn't trust anyone, let alone Picard. To her, all of this could just be an elaborate simulation to trick her somehow. Like that one episode of TNG where the Romulans did that very same thing to Riker with a holodeck program designed to get classified information from him. You know that Dodge had something inside of her that made her trust and seek out Picard. Soji doesn't have that at all. Were the sisters created not only from data but also from lore where the data essence was pushing Dodge towards Picard and the lore essence is pushing Soji away from him? Or did Bruce Maddox program a Picard's failsafe inside Dodge, knowing that she was going to be stationed on Earth where Picard lives, something that Soji on the Borg Cube wouldn't need at all. In this episode, we find out that Troy and Riker retired from Starfleet for entirely different reasons than Jean-Luc did. Picard resigned out of protest for the synth ban and the Federation pulling out of the Romulan rescue effort. Will and Deanna both served on the USS Titan, where Riker was the captain. They had a son named Thaddeus, who was born and raised on a star 
partnership, okay? But when Thaddeus was afflicted with a deadly silicone-based disease that could have easily been cured if there wasn't a ban on all synthetic research, they retired from Starfleet and moved their family to Nepenthe in the hopes that the planet's regenerative properties would help heal their son. They don't have a grudge against Starfleet or the Federation, and they didn't resign out of protest. They just put the lives of their children before their own careers. Will said that he's actually still on active reserve, so he could still be called up to serve once again, and being that his last rank was captain, that's probably the rank he would hold again if he was called up. Riker also mentioned that it would have to be a very good reason for him to accept the call to go back on duty, which leads me to believe that at some point in this series, maybe a couple episodes from now, maybe a couple seasons from now, that Captain Riker might show up to help Picard out of another jam that he gets himself into. Side note, Kestra was named after Deanna's long lost sister, but did you know that Thad was named after Will's ancestor, Colonel Thaddeus Riker, who fought for the North in the U.S. Civil War, which we learned about in the Voyager episode, Death Wish. Colonel Riker was actually saved by a Q named Quinn, meaning that William Riker would never have existed if it wasn't for the intervention of the Q continuum. A Q watching over the Riker family is something I think is still going on today. What? what, what? Throughout the episode, Kester keeps mentioning some old guy that lives on the other side of the lake named Captain Rupert Crandall. He's been everywhere in the galaxy, and he's even older than Picard. There's no Captain Crandall in Star Trek canon, you guys, so this is a new character. Or is it? After Soji describes the planet she might have been created on, Kestra sends a message to Captain Crandall, who instantly has all the information they need to find Soji's homeworld. As we know, Q once tried to convince Riker to join the Continuum at one point. He's also the one who summoned him up in that Voyager episode. He has an interest in Will. Kestra said that Crandall's ship is called the Inside Straight, which is a poker reference. In the very first scene in the very first episode of this series, Picard and Data are playing poker in 10 forward. Data reveals that he's holding an impossible five of a kind hand with an impossible flush. All the cards were queen of hearts, which of course are all Q cards, which we all figured was not only a reference to Q, but a reference to the Borg Queen. And with Seven probably being reassimilated next week, it looks like both references are probably correct. Is Captain Crandall actually Q in disguise, not only keeping an eye on Riker, but also lending a hand to help Picard on his journey? Will he also help Picard at some point be healed from his aromatic syndrome? I want to hear your theories below. I loved meeting Kestra, and while she probably doesn't have empathic powers like her mother does, her quarter betazoid genes have definitely given her a deep sense of empathy for others, which is why she's so caring and kind when it comes to Soji. Kestra actually helps Soji calm the f down for a minute and get back on the path to trusting others once again. Kestra is a kid with her own unique way of seeing the world. She loves her family and she's also heavily into LARPing. My favorite scene from this episode was probably Riker getting Jean-Luc to admit for the first time that he's in over his head. Seeing Frakes back in front of the camera was well worth the wait, you guys, and I hope he decides to keep doing it because I miss him. I miss you, Johnny. I'm also grateful the writers didn't shove in a bottle of Chateau Picard into this episode because they totally could have. But I love that while Riker was working out why Picard showed up at his doorstep in the first place, Jean-Luc was silently judging the wine of his competitor in the scene. So nice work, show. I also noticed that the bottle of wine totally had a barcode on the back of the label, so oops. Also going on in this episode, we find Hugh captured by Hot Pants Nerissa, who by the way, might actually turn out to be the brother Narek was talking about when he first met Soji in episode one. Nerissa is grilling Hugh for the location of Picard and Soji. She kills a bunch of XBs right in front of him to try and get him to talk. He does not talk. She then gives us a clue as to why the Tal Shiar are trying to destroy all synths. She tells Hugh that thanks to him letting Picard and Soji escape, it will possibly lead to the loss of trillions of lives across half of the galaxy. So, as I predicted in earlier reviews of Star Trek Picard, the Tal Shiar believe that what they are doing is going to save countless lives. The needs of the many, you guys. I do still think Nerissa is going going to be a bad guy when all is said and done. Why? Because she killed Hugh and she's a jerk. This series has breathed new life into the Hugh character, okay? Gave him something to fight for. Gave him something the TNG series never gave him in the two or three episodes that he appeared in. His humanity. He died an honorable death. What's the point of bringing him back if they're just going to kill him? Well, I told you. The series lifted up the character and gave him purpose in the Star Trek universe. His death serves the story and it serves the audience because now we absolutely hate Nerissa. 
purpose. It gives us all a common purpose to rally behind. Before Star Trek Picard was announced, I never thought about Hugh, where he might have ended up, what's he doing right now. He wasn't an important character to the overall series. I didn't know if he was alive or dead, and I didn't care, because the TNG series didn't care. This show has made Hugh real to me. A year ago, I didn't care if he was alive, but now his death is important to me. It triggers me, you guys, and Nerissa will be made to pay for what she has done. But of course, we have to remember Seven and her Delta Quadrant Nano probes are on their way, so maybe she can bring Hugh back to life. I've seen her do crazier things with those nano probes, but she's not going to bring him back to life, you guys. Killing off a character like that just so you can bring them back later shows a lack of confidence in yourself as a writer to stand behind your convictions. I'm talking to you in search of Spock. The rest of the crew, everything going on in the Lost Serena was flawless in this episode to me. Everyone was great. Finally, Rio's trying to figure out how Narek keeps finding them. Raffi turning on her schmoozing skills to get Agnes to calm down and open up was great. Check out every scene in this episode with Dr. Gerardi. Allison Pill really stepped it up here, you guys. After Commodore O mind melded with Agnes in the park and showed her what would happen if synths weren't destroyed, was a very powerful performance for me. Gerardi instantly changed her mind about everything she knew in her life and was ready to join the Commodore's cause. We've been led to believe that the Commodore is a Vulcan, but many people in the cast have already referred to her as a Romulan. She was even wearing sunglasses in that park scene with Agnes, which a Vulcan wouldn't need because they have extra eyelids. Vulcans Romulans have a shared lineage, so it makes sense that some Romulans, if they wanted to, could learn to perform a mind meld, especially if keeping certain information super secret were a priority. I'm pretty sure Commodore O is a mind melding Romulan spy, possibly from the future, who has traveled back in time to try and stop sense from destroying half the galaxy. We as the audience were only shown a tiny bit of what Agnes was shown by the Commodore in that mind meld, but it looks like the rest of that knowledge is going to be given to Jean-Luc Picard next week. I can't wait to see what he does once he learns the truth and how he reacts to Gerardi killing Maddox. While the La Serena's EMH didn't see Agnes actually kill Bruce Maddox in sickbay, he did see that Bruce was in trouble before he was deactivated. I've heard it on good authority that the emergency medical hologram will be given a chance to tell his side of the story really soon. Very happy that I'm loving Elnor in this series. We left him in this episode just trying to stay alive. He finds a Fitness Rangers SOS tag that he presses. At first, I thought Picard must have left it behind because he figured Elnor and Hugh would need it more than he does, plus he's going to be so far away it wouldn't even work. But I went back and watched all the Picard scenes on the Borg Cube, and I didn't see him ever bring it out. But I did learn that in that sector of space, Fitness Rangers SOS tags are pretty commonplace, especially for someone like Hugh, who Seven would have a vested interest in helping if he ever needed it. So the SOS tag was probably Hughes. But ain't gonna lie, it was definitely extra convenient that Elnor happened to stumble across it. But name any action movie or show where our hero doesn't happen across some lucky convenience at some point. Oh no, I'm pinned down by cyber terrorists and I'm all out of ammo. Good thing that mysterious skateboard kid happened to leave a magical bazooka inside this trash can I'm hiding in. So far, I'm enjoying every second of Star Trek Picard, which is a huge relief. I like talking about things that I enjoy, which is a rarity in this day and age. It's why I'm so passionate about the Orville. I love it. It challenges me. It makes me think. It makes me laugh. It makes me cry. I gave each season, each episode of Discovery a fair shot each and every time, and it failed to impress me each and every time. I'm glad I did the same for Star Trek Picard because the care taken into honoring these characters and tying it together to the stories we already know, yet giving us a completely new adventure is not only hard, it's pretty much impossible. While CBS seems dead set on continuing on with their new brand of Star Trek, I don't see them or anyone else really being able to reproduce what is going on in this series. We're getting caught up with old friends, or at least people who lived very similar lives to our old friends in whatever timeline they exist in. Jean-Luc Picard boldly going once again is a venture that cannot be taken lightly. Bringing Patrick Stewart in, who knows how important the legacy of this character is, comes with a high set of requirements to honor the past while reaching toward the future. Those standards simply don't exist with whatever new Star Trek show CBS decides to come out with in the future, in my opinion. Star Trek Picard is the last true piece of actual Star Trek history I think we'll ever see at this caliber. And when I say Star Trek history, I don't mean Star Trek canon. It's two different things. I'm sure we'll see new crews and new ships go out into the stars in some fashion. I just have doubts they'll ever be able to do it so boldly. But I 
would love to be proved wrong. I am grateful that going into this new series, I didn't allow my individuality to be assimilated by some sort of echo chamber hive mind angrily clasping to a bygone era that never existed in the first place, but has become a distant memory wrapped in a feeling that constantly plays over and over again in a holodeck program somewhere next to a member berry patch. Just like Soji and Dodge, Star Trek Picard was created out of the remnant of an old friend, a very dear friend, and the greatest damn captain in the universe. This is the moment where the next generation has become the final generation, and whatever Jean-Luc Picard needs from me, I'm all in. We've got only three more episodes left of this first season of Star Trek Picard, and in the next episode, Broken Pieces, Seven returns to bring the Borg Cube back to life. Picard realizes just how far many will go to preserve secrets stretching back generations. The La Serena crew deal with secrets of their own, and we finally learn the devastating truth behind the synth attack on Mars. Much like Crewman Daniels on Enterprise, do you think Commodore O is actually someone from the future on a mission to save the past? Do you think Seven will use her reassignment back into the collective for good or will her resistance be futile? How do you think Picard will react once he finds out what Agnes thinks she knows about sense and that she killed Bruce Maddox? Will Captain Crandall turn out to be Q in disguise? You can let me know what you think by joining the conversation below. I'll see you very soon and as always I hope all your times are egotastic fun times. Love you, bye bye! <laughs>